Rabbi Leib Tropper, you had a unique and special relationship with HaRav, HaGoyen, Maran, HaRav Chaim Pekas Scheinberg, Zeket Sadek Lebracha. Tell us about the relationship, and if you go back to your earliest recollection, when did that relationship actually begin? Uh, Perhaps I'm glad you asked. It's a very big schuss for me to speak about that part of my life. Um, there is, uh, when I, when I um, actually my relationship began, the genesis of my relationship with, with Hashem began in the eighth day of my, after I was born, as he was my sandak, uh, at my bris. So my father told me. And um, he had a, he was close, close, or he had some relationship with my grandfather, who I was named after at the bris, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Fora. And my father was a student of Hafez Chaim Yeshiva, and he was close to Hashemberg. And my father lived in the Lower East Side, and Rav Scheinberg lived in the Lower East Side, and he was tr- extremely close to Rav Scheinberg. So that's how it started the first time I had an interaction with real interaction with Rav Scheinberg. Maybe I was screaming in his lap, but, I, but it was an interaction in, in, in any event. Um, we got to his history, his, you asked me before about his, what I know about him. As in, I mean, he, he, when I would see his demeanor when he came into. RJJ, when I was maybe five or six or seven or eight, and see when you come to certain simchas, when I dive in there on Shabbos, and you know, RJJ was a wall-to-wall Talmud Chacham building. Was, every every person in the Mizrach was, was independently worthy of being a Rosh Yeshiva. So these were the Rosh Yeshiva of RJJ, but they were unbelievable to me, the Chachamim. And, um, and if Shainberg would come on Shabbos, and more often this bar mitzvah, that bar mitzvah, and, would, and, I, and just watching that and seeing that whole demeanor that he was just uh, was, was surrounded with and I just kind of um, was taken by it. It caught me it, like a gravity pull. And um, I started inquiring about Rav Scheinberg from my father. And I found out some great things. You know, you, at that time already you stopped talking on Shabbos. He wasn't talking. I wanted to know why. Why wasn't this? And I've never seen a person who doesn't talk on Shabbos. So I was too little, too young to go over to Rosh Hashiv and say, Rav Scheinberg, um, how come you don't talk on Shabbos? So I asked my father. So my father asked Rosh Hashiva. But then I saw, just before my father came back with the response, I saw that in the Vilna Gaon, he writes in his Geras Agro, the quote of the Yishalmi, the Toysus brings in Shabbos, Bekoshi hitiru loimar shalom b'Shabbos. The Dabir Dover, our words have to be especially unique on Shabbos, different than the whole week. And the Yishalmi says that it was very difficult for the rabbis to allow even to say Shalom on Shabbos, because it's not the Rei Torah. So I thought that was the reason, because he wanted to... Subsequently, I found that, discovered that he had an issue with one of his children who was sick, very sick. And he, and he made a promise to the Abishta that if Abishta will give him back his daughter... To take him out from the from back this what it looked like terminal illness, you know, then he will make the kala Shabbos so beautiful. And he did kept his word. He never the the fever broke that night, and he never spoke again on Friday night. Anything or did he speak Dibri Torah? I'm sorry, right? I should PS that with he only spoke Dibri Torah. Anything but Dibri Torah. He gave a shmuz on Shabbos, Dibri Torah. He tried to avoid it. For example, for Shaila, if he was also a mutter question, if it was prohibited or permitted question, he would just say, mutter, he'd say, make this, you know, shake his head and nod. And if it wasn't, he would turn his head the other way. That was not permitted. But when he had to say Dibre Torah, he said Dibre Torah. And I was very, I guess that, that kind of aura of enigma that surrounded him, you know, that this mysterious kind of behavior, which was unseen before, was kind of it captivating me. Like, what's going on? Like, well, what? And then I didn't what, did not know that when he came to the yeshiva on Shabbos, when he was there, and we saw him looking like somebody playing, like you would say, a Green Bay Packer, you know, football with the tzitzis. That that really took me back. <laughs> that was like, like over the top. And I again asked my father why, and he said that the Rosh yeshiva that time Mashgicha Chafetz Chaim. Because he was a Meshkich of Chavetz Chaim at the time, Rabbi David Lieber would say, Chetzadik Lebracha. It's some kabbal he made, and I'm, no, nobody knows the reason. He, he never shared the reason with anyone. As far as he knew. Maybe he shared it with his wife, maybe he shared it with Puna, but nobody knew the real reason why he did those sitzes.
Well, he did These that. things all looked very natural. When a person saw them, you didn't feel like you were looking at something outlandish. They were very down-to-earth and natural, as, as unusual as they were. Exactly, at a time. In other words, it's just seeing him the first time, not knowing how great he was and what he was, it looked, did look outlandish. But when it, you, got to, you got to spend one day with him, you say, it would look outlandish if he didn't have that. It was like kind of, it so fitted him. It fitted him just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an act. It was, it was organic. It was real. It was very real. Very consistent with himself as a person. But he was very American. He was very American, as he called himself. And many times he lectured in the Yeshiva, he called himself, I started off, I was selling sh- newspapers on the street corners. That's something about himself that he would revealed on Shavuos. Every Shavuos he would talk about that. He would talk about how he used to be called him Lefty Scheinberg. And the Shishiva Zatzal had that special, gifted, Lower East Side accent, Lefty Scheinberg, Baker Night Toyn, you buy a shite, and label money, you're going to eat the fish, is a little bite, but it's good. You know, he was really like like a real Lower East Sider. I mean, he was grew up in Lower East Side as a child. He grew up in Lower East Side. Then he was, got married to Rav Herman's daughter. And then he went to study in Europe, learning the Mir Yeshiva. And he went to talk to a Baruch Baron learning a number of times. And he went to the Biskarov once. And he was um, then considered to be a great, great uh, Torah personality. He got Smircha at a very young age under the Chuppah. He got Smircha on, besides the Yerdeya, and Hashem and Ezekiel, I understand, um, which is uh, uh, 19 years old, amazing accomplishment. Well, another profundity of Rav Scheinberg Zetzal's uh, personality was, though he was very warm and very kind, he was a frugal person. He, do, he, didn't, he, he knew the chashivas of things and money. There was a, uh, there's a story, popular story, I told by my aunt, who was very close to Rebbe Scheinberg, Rebbe Scheinberg, Allah Shalom, told her the story. When Rebbe Scheinberg was dating Rebbe Reb Herman's daughter, this is Rebbe ultimately, they went to Hester Street Park to take a walk. That was a date. It wasn't like today you have to spend $250 before you walk out the door. He took a, he took a walk through Hester Street Park on the Lower East Side, Essex Street, you know that is that. And she said uh, to him, you know, I'm thirsty. Now there are a number of stores around. The, so Scheinberg Zetzal, the Shishiva, took it to a water fountain. In those days, they didn't have water cools in the fountain. They were like, you know, those cement things around there. He pressed the button and said, please, can I drink? So, so you can imagine how outraged she was. Like, she couldn't say anything, but she was kind of, what's, what, like, where's my Diet Coke? Where's my regular Coke? Where's my orange soda? Where's whatever it is? So she went and told the father, Zetzal, the Rav Yaakov Ezer Herman. He said, he's very cheap, I don't understand him, he's outlandishly cheap, what's this? He said, you should respect someone who respects money. And he, I, if, I remember, if I remember correctly, like he even like gave a little patch, even though she was an older woman. He says, you, know, you have to respect someone who really does not, doesn't throw his money around like that. Of course, that's antique Judaism, um, antique way of living in general, but particularly antique Judaism. What other things do you remember about him in terms of the way he treated his Talmudim each and every Talmud and his godless in in learning? I mean, I think people need to be aware of just how great he was in his own personal limit of Torah, his Hasimud, his godless. Can we get a, a gauge, can we fathom to any degree how great, how vast, how deep, how, how broad in depth his, his, his grasp of Torah was? It's a fascinating question. Um, in truth, uh, one of the dinners that I was on, I think you may remember that I was on it a number of years ago with the dinner, and uh, as a speaker, as a guest of honor, so I, I spoke, everybody was talking about the greatness of Shami and Sitkis and his Anova and his humility and other things, and I focused, well, I said, you know, we got to stop talking about all these brachas and miracles and everything else, we got to talk about his greatness as a, as a, as a Talmud Chacham. The Rosh Hashiva put out his first sefer before he was 40 years old, to Basakhashin on a difficult uh, <laughs> safer, not a, not a very easy one. And he, he, he had a haskama from Mrs. Alma Meltza, the Baron Kotler's father in law, who wrote on him, Boki Bechol Chadre Taira, in his haskama. And so did the Chibina Rav Zechatadik Levacha, Boki Bechol Chadre Taira. He's maybe 38 years old at the time. If he Boki Bechadre Taira at the 38, he probably was a Boki Bechol Chadre Taira at 35. 
and he was a bucky star, maybe at 25. So he was um, he knew everything. His memory he had, he had a memory, gifted memory, that was very, very, very unusual, hard to find, hard to compare to, and he never liked to just take things simple the way it says in the Gemara. He would work hard and perhaps even to the point of great depth and great toil and talk about that a lot, about how important it is, not just the learning and the knowledge, but the quality of the learning to him was a defining point of, of, the, of, a, of a Ben Torah. Lima ha Torah biyagiya, the effort. And you don't understand Torah, but you go again, and you don't understand, then you go again. Is it much much more important to them than somebody learning eight blood gemara in one in one time without yigi? And he explained very very. It's, it's was a very interesting point. He said to me once. At that time I was a bachar. He said, "Label, you know, when somebody's a genius and able to like learn tosos, he says so he has a brilliant mind and he just learns Torah with it. Instead of, he could have studied mathematics, he could have studied geometry, he could have studied physics. He chose to study Torah. When somebody with a difficult mind has a hard time." And he works himself through Tysus with difficulty. His mind becomes a Torah mind because the Torah developed his mind. It's a whole big difference. It's a, it's a whole different person. So he gave us that kind of chizik to people in the yeshiva. And he would give a Mishnah Barush here every day. And every, every, I mean, every sif, four volumes, five volumes of Mishnah Barush, he learned with him every morning, you know, two, four, five halachas in the morning. He would know the sources in the Gemara with Rashi, Taisu, Rishayim, and Gold, Achrayim, every tube of Sefer that came out. It was not to believe. It was not to believe. It was something that you, you, it was entertaining and it was educational. Just to see, I see, and he said, wow, this is somebody who is a Kelly Van Veyu. He's, he's a, he is a, he is a replica of what a Jew who's close to the Abishta should be like. This is really replicates that being a real, you know, Torah Jew in, it, in every shape or form. It really is. In his Shi'ithas of Torah, and also in his conveying that to Talmidim, was it exclusively by example, or were there things that he would urge Talmidim on in their own way to do? Well, th- there were things that, for example, I mean, in, in his ki- he had gave two Shmuz in a week. On Shabbos, when he didn't talk, he gave a Shmuz, Devi Torah, we said he, sp- he didn't speak, only Devi Torah. And that was Shmuz in Ben Adam Lamakam. On, m- on Monday night, he gave a Shmuz, Ben Adam Lachaberi. And his demand in the Adam Lachaberi was more than his demand in the Adam Lamakam. You know, they say stories about Rashaimberg but in his Indian Machesid when he was younger. I mean I can't we cannot expect so many when he's um thirty five years old to act like when he the same age at seventy five, but he was he would go to weddings. In those days if you I don't know, early days in the in the in the forties and the fifties and the sixties, in those days they would used to give out they used to have on like like a schnapps cup or a regular little plastic cup and put like cigarettes in the middle of the table. The people, you know, that we put benches and they used to have they used to put cigarettes and we take a cigarette because it wasn't that time it wasn't uh, considered to be harmful. So after the wedding he would w- wait and look around and he said, he'd grab it, save it. And then he'd take come to the Shiva. And when he saw somebody go to his friend and say to his friend, This is a uh, Yangle. You have a cigarette? He'd say. He, he would call them over, he says, I have a cigarette here. They say there was a tukufa to your time. And when, they say, when I say they say, I mean I heard from Talmidim who were before me, preceded me. He had like six pens in his pocket. So I need to you know, yeah, I have a pen here. So he, he just thought of he thought of things of ways to do chesed that weren't bittel tyre. It wasn't such a big deal, you know. It was an amazing thing to see. And he used to be the as as the, as the when he would sit in front by the door, people come into you to Yeshiva in the morning Seder so we wanted people to come on time 9.15 whatever it was to come right after breakfast to come to Seder he came here a few minutes late so of course in other Yeshivas they would either dock you or somehow reprimand you the Yeshiva was very very sensitive to Busha tremendously sensitive to Busha so what, what would he do he would come in the room so he would just he'd pay, he'd come to the Bishmetrish and he was standing by the door all you do was like this that's it let's say a word that was enough, enough that the person understood. That. So it was such a, see, like, I, I, me at least, I internalized that forever. Netzach Tzachim, it meant so much to me. It meant so much to see that the Shishiva, the Godel Hador, one of the Godel Hador, was so careful about another person's sensitivities. It wasn't, even if the person didn't, didn't care if the Shishiva would yell at him or not, he still, maybe he'll care, maybe he'll, who knows what. 
were there things in terms of, as you just mentioned, midos, bein odom that you, that you also noticed, by example, that things that characterized him that you have carried with you, you know, as a, as, as a Talmud, and, and do you think made a, a Roshim on you, made an indentation, an impression on you? I mean, one of the greatest things that the Rosh Hashiva kind of communicated through his actions and chesed that we all learn, and through his shmuzin all the time, is this exact point about being makbid on the tsar of another yid being deliberate and very, very careful, cautious, like walking on eggshells when it comes to hurting somebody with words, I know the There were times that the Yeshiva had to say things about things and people, sometimes he said things and issues there on Klai, so they voiced his opinion because he felt he had to. But in a, in a general sense, denigration of a human being was, the, I think, the most, uh, it was a capital crime. He was also a great Ohev Eretz Yisrael. How, how did that come across? Um, Ob- obviously, he lived there. Right, right. It's, he lived there, and his shver moved there. His father-in-law, Yaakov Yosef Herman, was also a big Oyev Eretz Yisrael, and he encouraged people to move to Eretz Yisrael, and he really tried to minimize his trips to Eretz America and come right back to, like, back yourself quicker, wherever he can. Like, he wouldn't want to get a question. I can make, maybe I can make more money another day, maybe not. He would choose to go back to Eretz Yisrael. To him, Eretz was like par- Ruchnistic a paradise. And he, he demonstrated that to his Talmudim in so many ways. Ex- by example of his, I mean, even, even during the, his le- lectures in the Six Day War, I must tell you that it was a, it, uh, so, and it, this, uh, this is an amazing story. Um, I was just maybe barely 15 at that time, 67. And, um, it's a long story. I'm not going to go make the story that I, I once wrote, wrote, wrote up in the story, but the, um, the sirens went off. And you think that she would get in a car and go home. It was a matter of stuff. It was only like a mile, mile and a half away. June 7th of 67. That's when it happened. She was stayed with his told me them. Five days before that, the Shiva the was in a Velas. His, I think for his mother and he came to the Shiva the Mechazik the Adam was nervous about the war and they closed the streets of, of um, Tehran whatever it was called um, uh, of what? Kofavaku? yeah yeah Kofavaku right? so they, they closed that and he came to give Chizik and whatever and, and there was and he wasn't excited about people leaving he said you know I was you know, Eretz Yisrael Eretz Yisrael I mean Eretz Yisrael is the biggest Shmira in the world what kind of biggest Shmira could you have in Eretz Yisrael and the Mishishiva was, that, that, that's where he was. And then he stayed with the Bacham. I want to just tell you, I mean, it was just like, Mamish, I, I can't, like I, brings up choking memories when I, when I uh, remember, he slept next to us. We slept in the hall in the disc in the orphan home. And the Mishishiva slept on a little bed, all lights were out. And you think, he, how could a person sleep? I mean, but you know, the Mishishiva's biggest meter was Betachen, everything was Betachen, they were safe around Betachen. She was slept, he was snoring, like nothing was going on. And you know how it gets when people get these little esoteric ideas in their head, they they think, well, I'll sleep under the Rashiva's bed, maybe as a special, <laughs> they had like five guys squashed under the Rashiva's bed to sleep because of maybe extra protection. The next morning, the Rashiva saw, somebody gave him a binoculars to show him, the base of well was a Kevish Mulnavi, which was, we were, we were in a very tall building that was facing the, another high mountain in Arab territory. And the Shishiba saw an Egged bus, Israel bus, Israeli bus, an Egged bus that, was, that soldiers were getting off on and holding on to the base of He cried from Simcha and he sang Nishmas Glachai. Like the Eretz meant everything to him, like Mamish, you know, like that was, this is Amravinu, whatever, this is the land that schools, Hatayu, the schools of. The, of the, all my Shabbat wanted to do with life was all his feels was to see Eretz Yisrael. Eretz, Chemda, Taibur, Chava. There's something to the Eretz Yisrael of, you know, Avudi Yisrael Machim that has a special Ashbon people, Chachma and everything, the brachas that Eretz Yisrael gives forth to the Klai Yisrael. And the Rashiva utilized every single one. He was so, so, so in love, but not in the way that anyway smacked of the Zionistic love of Israel but the way of love the, of the way the Torah is in love of Eretz and the, me, the inner meaning the Ruchnistic meaning of Eretz only the Ruchnistic meaning of Eretz he would have a very difficult time talking bad about people 
even who are not from an Eretz Yisrael, but, but always probably Rosh Hashanah was a, big, was a big thing for him in any event. But people who lived in Eretz Yisrael was like really Yisrael. I mean, even the people in the government, he would disagree with them and say it's a terrible thing. But to say something like you know, some people use some kind of name, you know, adjective that was almost like a curse, and they would say, and then he would just never ever wouldn't allow us. He would stop right away. And, oh no no no. So that's the Rashiva's attachment to Eretz Yisrael. Would you leave us with some thoughts about you uh, being a Talmud Mubuk as he described you, um, the things that you're going to carry with you among the things that you mentioned now, that for each of us, to make it more than just a nostalgic review and a thought of an Adam Gadol, what do we have to take Allah Lamaisa substantively with us that we can put in our daily lives and implement? At, you know, at this moment, that any, any, anybody could, could it's, do. It, it, it's almost a profanity to use a comparable concept in business world, but I want to, I want to say it because it, that impresses it all. The Shiva wasn't born a genius. He wasn't born holy from the beginning. I want to just say, parrots, to the great praise of the Rosh Shiva, to becoming Lamaila from the Teva was, hurts may be better, but Avish tries harder. And his trying harder was really what made him the great Gon above and beyond towering figure beyond and above others that were born with great minds and great inspiration and great parents or family fathers of a shoemaker or a tailor I think he was and he just towered above them in such a great way because hurts may be better but Avis tries harder thanks so much thank you Rabbi Leib Tropper <laughs>